let's talk about Donald Trump. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nice. Uh, okay. Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Steven Zuber. I'm Jess Dickey. And today we are going to be talking about... Well, we're just going to have one of those episodes where we talk about a few things that we have found interesting recently. And we're kicking off with something that was in the news not as recently now, still kind of recently, but by the time this airs, it's going to be like ancient history. There's going to be something new and more outrageous that has happened because that's the world we live in. And uh, we're actually recording a little fair bit ahead of time now so we because we want to get ahead of things for Thanksgiving. And let's be honest, if we released this, we're recording on Saturday. If we released it on Wednesday, this Wednesday, then there'd be already a new scandal to talk about. So That's true. Yeah, so we're not talking just random stuff. We're, there's a theme around the rest of this, but we're getting kicked off by an interesting thing about, I guess, why truth matters. And we're going to put up a fun example of untruthing. Yeah. All right. This, this really blew me away. Um, as probably everyone knows by now, the Trump administration kicked out uh, Jeff Acosta, I believe is his name. Yeah, but he actually won the suit to be allowed back. But that's not really the point. Yeah. Yeah. They kicked out Jeff Costa saying that he had, like, manhandled or attacked an intern or something. He's a journalist from CNN. Yes, should, he's a yeah. journalist from CNN. They were asking some questions. An intern came and tried to take the microphone away from him. And he, I don't know, didn't let her, I guess. It's not like he pushed her or anything. He just held onto the microphone. And uh, the White House said, okay, we're revoking his press credentials. He assaulted our intern. And they released... The, the thing is, this was on TV. Like, everyone saw this. And if someone who didn't see it could see it very easily you know it was one of those things where look at how ridiculous this white house is and if you watch any of the comedy shows you saw footage of it and then they said he accosted our intern and put up this doctored video footage <laughs> from um infowars the the conspiracy theorist guy that's been kicked off all these media platforms so to be clear this video was tw this this video was tweeted out by the official twitter handle of the press secretary for the white house yes yeah so this wasn't just supporters putting this out which would have been egregious enough yeah this was the official link from the press section of the white house saying this is why he's not allowed back yeah yeah and the really like the crazy thing is we know trump lies and his white house lies blatantly without shame don't acknowledge it don't care at all right they will just say whatever they want to say it's it's not even like lying for the most part because lying implies that you keep some some image of what the truth is in your head so you can keep your lie straight. Or, they just say whatever the fuck. Or lying at the very least is trying to, to spin a narrative. You know, it, it could be all false presentation, but you're, you're doing it with the goal of saying, no, nope, believe this instead. Then it's not even that articulate with yeah. this. It's just more like, I mean. Here's our version of the truth. Yeah. yeah. Alternate facts came around like, in just 2016. Directly. Yeah. yeah. I remember, you know, when George Bush's White House had the, what, uh, reality-based community, there was that line about that. Yeah. The, the alternative facts is the one of this one, which is, oh, no, you guys have your facts. We have our, we have our alternative facts where, you know, starting on Inauguration Day where, he's, where Trump said, I won by the most votes or by, had the most votes since Ronald Reagan. I had the largest turnout ever. Yeah. Um, you know, hours after being sworn in minutes the, these things were already pouring out so what really blew me away was that they released doctored footage which literally everyone even his most ardent supporters can see is doctored no it's doctored and just accept people ex expect people to go along with it i guess but they do i don't i don't understand it was like this is the first time i mean there have been lots of comparisons made to 1984 already but this was the first time that i saw something like this and i thought oh my god i literally remember the scene from 1984 where everyone is shouting about how glad they are that we're at war with uh, East Asia. And then at the stroke of midnight, the government says, actually, we're at war with Eurasia. And everyone's like, we've always been at war with Eurasia! And all the banners come down and are replaced with different ones. And everyone simply starts touting the new truth as if that was always who they'd been at war with, you know? I'm like, everybody knows it's a lie and they're they're going along with it like why in, it it blew my fucking mind in 1984 at least the whole society had been explicitly trained and programmed to behave that way but it's kind of sadder that people just naturally behave that way <laughs> yeah that's, that's way worse you're right it's one thing it was browbeaten into you 
over, I don't know, I'm assuming a generation or two, instead of people just like eagerly lapping this up and pushing this out. Yeah. So the, the doctored version is is subtle. I had to see a side by side to really see the difference. Well, I but could, what the, I, what what shows up, and I'll put a link to the side by side. Basically, uh, Acosta's asking, I guess, challenging questions. I saw a GIF, so I didn't see the sound. And somebody kind of ushers this woman over to go take the microphone. She goes to get it, and he kind of just holds it. He doesn't surrender the microphone. Mm -hmm. You see her kind of tug it, and him not let his arm bend. Mm -hmm. In the doctored version, there's like a jerking of his elbow when she like moves back as if she was kind of pushed and there's like this quick chopping motion of his other hand as if he was hitting her yeah it's it's uh <laughs> it's enough to yeah it seems like it's a bad it's not it's even a, a good doctor yeah it's mm -hmm. a good doctor it's excuse me yeah it's a bad doctoring but it's it's also like not super egregious it's not like oh look and here's the you know the the moment when his fist made connect you know connection with right. their face look it's just but the weird thing is you don't have to watch him side by side at least i didn't because i saw the original footage first when it first happened and I didn't think anything of it. And then I saw the, you know, the doctored footage. And it looks convincing enough on the first pass. But, like, this was not at all what was in my memory. And it was so fucking weird to see something like that. Because, yeah. I, you know, immediately I was like, that's not what happened. How is this, how does this video exist? I wonder if other people see the second footage and kind of just, oh, that, that's not what I remember happened. I guess I'll just update to... <laughs> I, maybe this is not what happened i guess i guess i just misremembered yeah it's oh, not, i didn't remember it being that harsh huh yeah it's, it's a subtle enough change is that what i was saying it's not like they changed out the the players involved or something like that or right. you know, moved the room or something it's but, not like there's a roundhouse kick involved or something but i mean yeah the thing is i don't know it's it's hard to not sound like a, a scaremonger or something when you're saying oh look how big a deal this is you know comparing to 1984 or whatever people will be like oh you're just you're freaking out this is just one little gif whatever you know three second video mm -hmm. but I think that the, you know, nothing jumps straight to 11, right? It's always a crawl. And, you know, for me, there was a few moments already when at some point last year, Trump said that he had never said the whole grab him by the pussy thing, even right. though he admitted to it during the debates. Um, oh, that was just locker room talk. Yeah, and then yeah. later he said that never happened. And nobody bats an eye because this is already things that he says every day. Mm -hmm. But then when he he was presenting or he was talking to the, the Assembly of the UN, what, a month ago, two months and he had said, you know, my administration's accomplished more than any other in the or in history. And there's a, a collective laughter from the assembly, which but since this isn't a comedy club, that's not really something that happens a lot. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when Fox News aired it, they cut the the laughter out, which yeah. is already kind of 1984-y. Yeah. And that's that's already doctored in a way. Um, no, that's definitely doctored. Yeah, but it, but it's it's not like they uh, they if they, if, they put, if they put in applause, yeah, cutting, that'd be not adding. that'd be more. But that's the thing is it's it's gradations right so it gets oh we just cut this little part out whatever but uh oh we just inserted a few frames whatever yeah so yeah. Th it's 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 little things at a time i mean what really blew me about this like all the other things were just him lying you know i'm used to him lying this was putting out fake evidence and expecting everyone to ac accept it as real and like the fact that they're expecting us to accept this is what really and i, I don't know did anyone a lot of people probably are you think that the people, his, like, the people really on his side, supporters? I think, are, yeah, going to believe whatever he says. Fuck. It's, yeah, they're going to say our version's doctored. I mean, like, people read InfoWars. Yeah. yeah, people are on r slash the Donald. People read InfoWars. Like, it's, I don't know how many of those people are just, like, explicit trolls. How many of them actually, you know, exist and how many of them are actually There's got to be real, tr like, true believers, though. There definitely are. They're, they're they out there. They always are. I mean, I've already written off the people at InfoWars that believe we're ruled by lizard people or whatever the fuck. You know, who, they're, they... Well, maybe they're you shouldn't nuts. write them off because they probably voted for Donald Trump. Well, yeah, their votes count as much as yours, which is damn it, democracy. <laughs> but like his base, if his base believes that stuff, I don't even know. I guess the other thing too is that this one was put forward by the press secretary of the United States. Yeah, and not the and not, not just, just Fox someone. News, which is basically the press secretary, but not not legally, right? <laughs> um, not officially. Yeah. So um, I think I, I agree with what you were saying, though, that it sets a bad precedent when you let things go like e even the lying even the cutting not so much the adding you, you have to call it out i think every time because it will get normalized over time when people just go oh haha ha. of course we just expect donald trump to lie about everything it loses its impact it already has like that's it the has. thing is i mean you know every time something insane happens you're just like oh yeah that's that's tuesday <laughs> and you know even like at a larger scale i know this is like not exactly related to the truth stuff but you know we had the largest massacre of jewish people on 
United States soil, what, a month ago oh, yeah. that synagogue got shot up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, th- this didn't even, I was talking with a friend of mine who's Jewish and he took off the date next day after work cause, or the following Monday, he just, you know, needed a day to decompress and whatever. And we, we talked about it and I think, and I totally agreed with his, his stance or his, what really perturbed him about this. Like this just didn't even really jar anybody. This is just like business as usual. It's just another yeah. shooting. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, in, in, in a way it definitely is, but the fact that we're so blase about it, there's no, I mean, there's definitely probably local, there actually was a great local response and all that stuff, but you know, this isn't, remember how like the world stopped and Columbine happened and stuff like there's, there's not just the time for that anymore. And nobody, nobody's, I think nobody bats an eye. I was most perturbed by the fact that in two weeks later, there was a, another mass shooting and the CNN uh, intro that I saw real quick, because, you know, I want to know what happened. Uh, the camera switches to the, the anchor and he goes, the worst mass shooting on American soil in 12 days. I'm like, fuck. We now say, yeah, in a double digit number of days for that sort of shit. Yeah, we need a, we need a place in Times Square where it's just like days since our last mass shooting. Right. I was just thinking about that. Somebody like has the to go by. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You have to like erase it. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all weird. But someone, I guess this is going to be a bad segue, but to push us into today's topic. Yeah. So what, man? It's, you know, that's your version of truth. This That's their version of truth. What's, what's the matter? What's the difference? Who really cares? I know we're not talking so much about truth today, but we're talking a bit tangentially. Yeah. So, you know, whatever, right? This, that's let them have their, their alternative facts. They're just as, you know, that's have your, have your real facts in quotes, if that's what you care about. What are you, what are you going to say? These are not real opinions of Steven Zuber. He's just <laughs> using air quotes left and right here. Yeah. Um, I, I say that that's bullshit. I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess I, I don't really know what to say when I, if, if someone were to earnestly come at me with that question. Yeah. And I guess I have something more fleshed out cause I've been thinking about it already, but the, I once had somebody when I was a teenager, we back when I was in my days of how much fun it was to like debate the existence of God with people, mm-hmm. and I kind of maybe moved her to think that God lo- there's no logical basis for her religion. She's like, so what? Then what's the point of logic? Oh, and wow. like okay. then I, I was kind of trapped for a while because like how do you logically persuade somebody? How do you use logic to persuade somebody who's not moved by the necessity of logic? Mm. And so I was like, oh, I guess you know. You, the whole thing, like you can't reason somebody into position that they haven't reasoned themselves into yeah. um, or reason somebody out of position. Mm-hmm. But I think when you're talking more fundamental than that, like truth and logic, you really just show them like you do care about the truth and logic of these things. You know, like I can imagine somebody, you know, oh, well, you know, I don't really care about truth and I get by just fine. It's like, sure you do. And if you, you care about alternative facts, if the vaccine that the doctor gave your baby, you thought it was a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, but it turned out to be nothing, you'd be pretty fucking pissed. Right. Their alternative fact of, oh, I just told you this what it was and charged you for it. You, you obviously care about the truth. So I can lay out a billion instances where you care about the truth and you can't. So then you, it's up to you to defend why these few instances you're willing to say oh truth doesn't matter i'm going to wave it away yeah so well it's motivated reasoning yeah you really want to believe in your religion yeah so you'll say anything to defend it and if your religion is your political party or your your favorite alternative therapy or something then your beliefs about climate change yeah so that that doesn't actually bring me to this next post but i swear that these are related uh once we get to it uh at lesswrong.com, Sailor Vulcan, uh, Vulcan, Sailor Vulcan mm-hmm. posted, "No, really, why aren't rationalists winning?" And I believe this is the same Sailor Vulcan that uh, comments sometimes at our subreddit slash the ba- r slash the Bayesian Conspiracy, and uh, because Sailor Vulcan has asked this before on our subreddit as well too, the um, they say that when others win in places where we fail, it makes sense to ask how, what skills or knowledge they have that we don't. And how might we obtain them? To say, this came up before, didn't we kind of cover this before in an episode? The why aren't rationalists winning thing? We talked about it a bit. In fact, this this quote here is right after they, they point out what our kind of argument was on the podcast. That, okay. Um, we, had, we had put forward, I don't know if it was our official conclusion or kind of our just throwing our hands up and suggesting this. It sounded like more of a thing that was come up with on the fly. Yeah. Okay. So we, um, I guess, first of all, we should talk about what we mean by winning. But before that, I wanted to, this, this, this quote that you just put out was right after they had said that our position or at least the argument we made on the show was uh that wasn't it that like winning relative to past you that's right or yeah it, it bumps you up a certain amount mm-hmm. um you know it can give you an extra 20 points of of success or whatever whatever I, your metric is i believe we brought um, up the example of someone who was uh living in a developing country somewhere 
and said that after learning the rationalism thing, he just noticed huge increases in life, uh, life outcomes, because nobody else was thinking in those terms, and they were failing at a lot of things that are pretty basic once you have some, you know, standard structural thought patterns down. And he said, if the entire society was structured like this, I could see how things would be much better. But, you know, for himself, he was doing a lot better. I don't remember that, actually. I just remembered that our, our kind of vague answer of saying that it could give you a bit of a boost relative to your your starting position. Mm -hmm. And this thing here was a was a response to our kind of cop out there that mm -hmm. Taylor Balkan called out that, um, look, it's, it's not to say you get a little bit of a boost. You, if you're getting anything, you need to be able to say, yeah. Like, why aren't rationalists the leaders of industry and... Yeah, or or better yet, like if 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 you're a rationalist and I'm not, or rather, say if you started from a higher place than I did, mm -hmm. I could still ask, why are you doing better? If I have the tools that rationality gives me, I should have those capabilities. Yeah, yeah the ability and, to actually break it down and systemize it and do it yourself. Yeah, so so winning here is achieving your goals. Yeah, we've talked about instrumental and epistemic rationality before, which I've also argued are kind of the same thing, but. The idea that you, epistemic rationality is using all of your your awesome rationality skills and and background con, uh, concepts from science and the scientific method to arrive at accurate beliefs, get a map that reflects the territory. Yeah. And instrumental rationality is getting to where you go, where you want to go, and achieving your goals. Yeah. And you use the truth to do that. Unless some people would argue that you use, you know, phony truths to do that. If that's what helps. Yeah. Um, I in think fact. some people who argue in favor of like the mysticism or uh, magic would, would say, look, it's not so much about epistemic rationality, it's about getting to my goals, whether I have to lie to myself or not. I think it's still the same thing. I mean, uh, talking about why does Donald Trump keep winning, for example, even though he's uh, baffling social scientists and psychologists, but um, whether it's intuitive on his part or not, like maybe he actually does have some kind of systemized understanding of how psychology works, and he, he's manipulating that, or maybe it's intuition, maybe he's just really good at that, naturally. But it's still because because of a truth about social science, about psychology, that he's winning. I would not call him a rationalist in any sense, though. Not even an instrumental one, really, because it's hard. I, I don't know enough about his full biography to give an account, but like I, I couldn't say that you, you're you're winning a lot if you if you've declared bankruptcy, you know, eight times on, you know, if you've had so many failed businesses, all of your businesses would flourish. Or you could say you're winning because look, I fucked up a hundred or a dozen times, and yet I'm still making money. Yeah, it right, didn't affect right. him. So. I th uh, Sailor Vulcan says, uh, rationalists are very good at epistemic rationality, but there's this thing that we've been referring to as instrumental rationality, which we're not so good at. I wouldn't say it's just one thing, though. Instrumental rationality seems like many different arts that we're all lumping together. And I'm... Um, I, I disagree that instrumental rationality is different arts lumped together. I feel like it's just applying epistemic rationality to a variety of applicable problems. Like, I don't think that y there's different arts of self-help or of you know, improving a business, it's all just applying rationality to whatever you're trying to do. I think certainly that applying rationality to what you're trying to do increases how how likely you are to do good at those things because you have a more accurate understanding of how things work. But I really, like when I say I wouldn't consider Donald Trump a rationalist, I think in large part that's because he doesn't seem to care about the truth or having an accurate picture in his mind of how the world really works. And no matter how instrumentally successful he is at his goals, I still wouldn't call him a rationalist. So I think a large part of what rationality is, is the focus on, epi um, ep is it epistemicism? Epistemology. Sure. Epistemology, <laughs> yeah. The, the, you know, actual trying to figure out the truth part. Yeah. Which is less instrumental, really. And I think, I think you guys are kind of conflating, or I, I don't know how much time we'd burn tabooing uh, rationality here, but... Um, the word rationality, yeah, but the like I call it truth seeking. Yeah, so so truth seeking is different than winning slash doing your goals. So like epistemic rationality, there are facts to be known about what steps you can take to win, and then there's like doing those things, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I mean, imagine how useless Contessa's power would be in Worm if she saw the path to victory but couldn't do any of those things, right? So it's like, I see all the steps it's I have. It's just acrasia. Okay. Yeah. So she's just got like this awesome acrasia power where she can see how to win, but can't actually do any of it. Well, I mean, what um, good is it to know, you know, exactly how you should swing a bat in order to hit a ball to get a home run if you don't have the physical still ne skill necessary to actually swing the bat that way? Yeah. So that, that, that would mean that you'd have to train up a whole different thing, right? Right. Actually swinging the bat. So I think that's, that's sort of what 
people are talking about with the different uh mm, I, I still think it's the same you're still applying the same epistemic rules it, it's just you, you do have to do this separate thing of you know achieving the bat swinging skill but like I don't, I don't think that you combine them together and now it is a new skill yeah no i agree i think um to quote Sealer Vulcan again, the art of epistemic rationality is how you achieve the value of truth. And up until now, instrumental rationality has been a catch-all term we've been using for the arts of winning at every other value. And I think I think that's been a problem, that instrumental rationality has been over-defined. It's been used as a catch-all for just doing good at life, which does not necessarily include the things that we care about when we speak about this whole rationality thing. Yeah. I, think I mean, obviously we want to do good at life, but... There's, all, there's also the puzzle of using the baseball analogy. I could be hitting home runs left and right, but have no idea the physics of a baseball. Right. And Which so, I think is what Donald Trump is doing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so um, while hitting a few foul balls and whatever, um, torturing the analogy as I often do. Um, but the the I guess the claim then from the rationalist community would be that, no, look, if you really understand the, the truths of everything involved with base, hitting a baseball, you'll be able to more reliably hit home runs or something. Or maybe knowing why you're hitting home runs, you can generalize that to other things. Um, and yet, there are people who, you know, would still, like I said, be able to hit base, hit home runs without, without knowing anything about it. I don't really know how that plays in here, other than to maybe illustrate that they are kind of two different things. Which I didn't think about, which I didn't, that wasn't my position going into this, but now I'm kind of leaning that way. Uh, can least, you explain that more? Um, I guess other than, like, you could get really good without leaving your 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 house about knowing everything about how to hit a baseball you could you know stephen hawking might know everything there's to know about you know hitting a home run except for actually being able to do it mm -hmm. whereas somebody else probably most major league baseball players can hit home runs but they don't they couldn't you know show you the the calculus of how baseball hitting a bat moves at a certain angle or something right so i, I guess maybe those truths aren't related to hitting a home run i think rationality might be something that would tell you how better to train your or how better to practice so that you get better at it faster or telling you some things like you should improve your upper arm strength to get more force behind the swing. Or, you know, if this is an option, which it probably wouldn't be, uh, make your bat out of different material in order to more effectively get the ball going. Yeah. And then dark arts rationality, like tricking yourself, would be going with all the superstitions that professional uh, sports people have. Like always wearing the same undershirt or something. Is well, that dark arts? Because I... Well, maybe, I don't know, if you're hacking your brain. Uh, but if you know you're lying to yourself, but you're doing it anyway, like somebody who, you know, writes sigils or, you know, prays or something. Well, I think rationality would be the thing that tells you not to waste time with that because it won't make any difference. Yeah, I thought um, dark arts was actually using the correct epistemology, but for and, bad reasons. I think I, you're right. I miss I misuse dark arts. But there's, there's a technique of self-deception that some people advocate of saying, look, I know it doesn't actually do anything, but it helps because right. it helps, helps me trick myself. Well, then it is doing something. You just have to be careful with it, though, if you start believing that it works because of magic yeah. rather than me tricking myself. And I couldn't make you a better baseball player by telling you not to wash your undershirt when you, before you go to play or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I feel like I've gotten off track. Yeah. Sorry. So um, they want to know why rationalists aren't winning for real. I think, A, winning is a hard thing to define. I mean, I feel like my life's gotten better in the last several years, but I didn't live the counterfactual life where I didn't figure and learn any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to... I mean, how, 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 you know, we, I think, you know, Justin and I talked about this a bit yesterday, like, unless you're going to do long, longitudinal kind of blinded studies, like I think the CIFAR organization tried to do a bit of those. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if they ever got enough results to publish or if I just haven't come across them. I didn't actually look for them, so they might be out there, but yeah, unless you're going to teach a random sample of people, all this stuff, and then follow up with them for the next decade and see how they're all doing, there's no way to know if it's helping yeah um you know who knows maybe my life maybe my life would suck if i didn't get into any of this stuff yeah. and now it's pretty good so maybe i am winning i do think that'd be a great thing to do if anyone could do that like if we had the funding to study that i think that cfar is studying that and yeah. I, I think there just hasn't been enough time but uh anecdotally i know people who have gone through the cfar program and highly recommend it said that it did actually make a significant difference in their lives i know my life has been improved by the whole rationality thing and yeah but i guess why aren't we all as successful as donald trump maybe is the is the implicit question here well i think it's or let me rephrase that because that's a bad example we don't want to be as, as successful as <laughs> yeah no, i don't know you. what successful means if you're a miserable fat old dude but right um well i think part his of his age doesn't come into it sorry yeah. <laughs> well, yeah he can't help how old he is right i mean i think part of it would be like asking well why isn't uh every baseball player as successful as donald trump if they're so good at hitting home runs i just don't think rationality is supposed to be a thing where 
no matter it's not like some kind of Bene Gesserit magical skill where you learn it and instantly you're better at everything I mean I think that everything that I try is influenced by this and made slightly better by the fact that I have these patterns of thinking but it's not an instant win code you know it's rationality itself is focused on having a more accurate view and seeking the truth and in as much as that helps you achieve your other goals it's beneficial but it's not a a thing for winning at other goals in itself there's also we've gotten a question a few times and i i wish i could find the person who wrote it in but i keep saying we're gonna get around to this and we're going to eventually this isn't the full reply but this will be part of it someone asked uh or mul multiple multiple people have asked like what does rationality look like in your real life like what do you do with this and my, I think, you know, there's, there's several things, but if there's one thing that I do most days is it's like, try to try to imagine and account for failure options for how things could go. Mm -hmm. And so I think as a result, I have a lot less tr like massive fuck ups than I would have had other, would have had otherwise. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm visualizing, okay, look, maybe it's not the best goal to invest all of my money in cryptocurrency, right. Or something like that. Yeah. Um, so one thing that this, you know, it's, it's maybe not winning, but it's definitely not losing to you know, plan for how things could go poorly if you were to follow through with this, this, this option. And if it looks like, Hey, this is definitely, you know, your odds of losing here are like 90%, then you just don't do the thing. And so that's, you know, not losing is a kind of winning, right? Yeah. yeah you're kind of uh, betting on probabilistic futures based on your actions or inactions. Yeah. In fact, I think Sailor Vulcan gets into that too with betting markets and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, a yeah. Little although bit. that's more talking about just winning money by betting on outcomes, not that's betting true. on what your actions are. Yeah. But that's so, like, why aren't we all rich from, you know, or uh, just like highly successful at prediction markets? Yeah, you're right. That's a, that's another thing. Because I, I, I don't lose every time I don't buy all the lottery tickets and, you know, empty my, you know, empty my accounts buying lottery tickets every day, right? So Scott hmm. uh, Alexander had an interesting reply to this, which part of my reply has also been influenced by. Uh, he replies in the comments to the post, so I'll link the direct link to that as well that it was wrong to ever focus on individual winning and we should drop the slogan. He says that if you are good at knowing what is true, then you can be good at knowing what is true about the best thing to do in a certain situation, which means you can be more successful than other people, which is, you know, probably where this rational should win idea got its real legs. So he says, I can't deny this makes sense. I can just point out that it doesn't resemble reality. Oh, you have a thing in here? I threw in one because we already brought up the example and Scott Alexander did too, that uh, Donald Trump continues to be more successful than every cognitive scientist and psychologist in the world combined. And this is a, this sort of thing seems to happen so consistently that I can no longer dismiss it as a fluke. He, he I just wanted to give us credit for thinking of the same, pu or he, he thought of the same kind of, not even wild card, just like this phenomena that we were discussing. Yeah, so not necessarily correlated. He points out that in the history of medicine, it started with wise women just using traditional herbs to cure things. And very smart people like Hippocrates came up with reasonable proposals for better ideas and did much worse than the wise women for thousands of years. And a lot of people died, but eventually things got better. And personally, I would not draw the line at Hippocrates because I, he still didn't use the scientific method. There, that, that was basically just a different version of, you know, superstition, in my opinion. I can see why someone who's taken the Hippocratic Oath might be <laughs> might come to Hippocrates. But right. yeah, but, I think anything done pre-science is like kind of not really fair. But even it's, so, the scientific, uh, I don't remember who pointed this out, but the scientific method was invented over two centuries ago. And well, uh, over it, two centuries before we, before we started washing our hands. Yes, yeah. right. It took, I mean, th it's. When you think about it, the scientific method is the weirdest fucking thing. It was basically just some people, most usually guys, because they had like the the extra time and money to do this sort of thing. Uh, just some people who were like interested in nature and was like, all right, let's, let's fuck around with nature, tinker a bit here and there, and see what we can find. Whoa, that was fucking weird. I'm writing that down, you know. And they just did this in their spare time for two hundred fucking years before we got anything of use out of it. And that is, first of all, that is a hell of a project, and I'm really admiring them and glad that they did this for so many years with no results but on the other hand it did take 200 years of groundwork before we got anything actionable out of it yeah scott said uh he's not sure that we can short circuit that spent 2000 years flailing around and being terrible step <laughs> yes which i think is one of my uh hypotheses also for why we're not dramatically winning we just haven't had enough time we're the first generation of rationalists uh the enlightenment to the extent that such a thing can be said to exist didn't happen overnight 
Yeah. And maybe the most important thing that we could do as the first generation is just keep building momentum. Like if you think of rationality as a martial art or a school of philosophy, how do these get passed down and built up through generations? And like even our Harry Potter from Methods of Rationality was overconfident in his ability to figure out the science behind magic. And he discounted things like entrenched systems and stronger players. So maybe we do need to get better at epistemic rationality before we can start winning. And maybe maybe the, the legacy of our winning will be that it took us 50 years rather than 200 because we were able to actually build on knowledge of human psychology that, you know, A, I guess standing on the shoulders of giants kind of thing, but B, just not fucking around for as long, um, you know, going at it with, with real gusto instead of... Or achieving more in like the same amount of time. I mean, hard problems do take time because you do have to do a lot of hard work. It's not just clever insights. Yeah. It's like, you know, elbow grease. Yeah, all the low, a lot of the low-hanging fruit was already grabbed. I wonder how much faster rationalists would have grabbed it if cognitive science was introduced in 1600 rather than 1950. I don't, I don't know. know. I also wonder how much of us failing to win is just that we've solved a lot of the low-hanging fruit and that we need to find a really important problem to work on. Well, and, and in, I think Scott Alexander goes on to point out a couple of those. You know, artificial friendly or friendly artificial intelligence, uh, effective altruism. Those are some wins that kind of came out of this community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think those are, like, just the fact that we're noticing them and kind of we got the rest of the world to start paying attention to for example ai safety is mm -hmm. kind of a big win i think yeah. so yeah i mean i'm not that old but i remember everything about ai used to just be terminator and stuff and that still as a joke is but you know now yeah, there was that thing with google recently with uh where they said that they weren't going to fund the project of ai based uh military technology yeah, yeah. and what would they have come to that same conclusion you know if we hadn't been proselytizing about AI being dangerous. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, we're getting big players on board. You know, Elon Musk is has a big platform. Um, you know, Bill Gates. Does Bill, Bill Gates has a position. Yeah, he's been yeah. out on this. Uh, I mean, even Stephen Hawking in the last years of his life. Yeah, Hawking. Sam Harris isn't really up there with those guys, but he's, you know, to his podcast of a million people, he's made, he's, he's in his words, made noises about this for the last few years. Um, I found it kind of frustrating that we haven't gotten the credit for that. Yeah. We know we've got the credit for it. <laughs> right. But that's it, one of those things that could increase uh, awareness of the rationality community and so that epistemic rationality is a good thing to learn. It's true. That's I mean, why it, I think uh, instrumental rationality is important. If you do help people get measurably better in some sense, people will take notice and ask, why did you, you know, what happened? What caused you to get so much better? And then we get more people on board. Yeah. yeah. Although, like... Focusing on friendly artificial intelligence is kind of like another, like a bigger example of me not losing is counting that as a win, right? Yeah. It's not a, it's not a, a public win because like, oh look, we didn't destroy the world, and it's like, who do we, who do we give credit for, to for this? And so it's less, less obvious, mm -hmm. but it could be the kind of thing like in retrospect they look back and be like, oh yeah, thank God these people were doing that <laughs> stuff back then because otherwise we, we might have done this differently. And we can view all the timelines. We're like, oh man, <laughs> look, look at what we dodged there. Yeah. I mean, in in fairness, I would rather that the world be saved and we not get the credit for it than we get the credit and the world not be saved. <laughs> so yeah. that's that that is my main focus. But yeah, it would be nice. It almost makes me wonder if we as a community should target like smaller problems. You know, I mean, uh, I don't want to take momentum away from effective altruism or developing friendly AI. Uh, that's the problem. But I mean, if we could pick certain things to work on, and then we'd actually have some measurable, you know, uh, success that we could kind of wave around like a flag. Do you have any? suggestions no <laughs> oh no okay <laughs> maybe that'd be a fun fun project to think of some some smaller goals that are you know achievable within a few years that you could say look we did it yeah. but but even then people would ask did you do it because you were determined and smart or because you're rationalists because it's probably not the rationalism thing rationalists yeah. are a weird group of introverts but i, I think i'm with you guys <laughs> that, that you know focusing on big things like ea and fai are are big wins even if like technically one of them is just not losing um you know i don't know ea is more of uh i'm trying to think that's it's not i think to, to some object objectors it might not be like solving a problem it's like great now actually cure now actually fix world hunger or cure malaria or something no, i have to really commend but, eighty thousand hours who for actually identifying the problems on the effective altruism side and prioritizing them oh me too i was just thinking that i'm trying to think of the of a cynical objector might say, look, yeah, you guys pointed out that this is wrong, but like now do better. It's like, we kind of fucking are. So, <laughs> um, not wasting our charity budget is sort of a huge deal mm -hmm. and advocating, you know, getting successfully getting lots of people on board. I don't have figures, but I'm sure people like McCaskill and Peter Singer do, um, of people who have, you know, been influenced over the last 40 years by people writing about this sort of stuff to, you know, in Singer's words, do good better or wait, no McCaskill. That was his book doing good better. Yeah. Um, Scott did say one thing I wanted, one last thing I wanted to pull out from his reply, 
is that he compared instrumental rationality to self-help, which is kind of not entirely inaccurate. I, I would say it's it kind of feels like a self-help thing, right? Uh, I think that's where I was kind of getting into whether or not we should taboo it or not, because, you know, again, the baseball player wearing the dirty jersey is self-helping in that way, right? Where they're, yeah. they're tricking themselves. If they have to believe this mumbo-jumbo to hit a home run, then that's what they have to do. But you can't sell that to somebody else. Right. And so that's the thing with a lot of self-help things that Scott points out, that this, this advice isn't generalizable. And if it is, it, it sounds like, like woo, yeah. right? Yeah, he says that once you start becoming a self-help community, you start developing all sorts of norms that help you be a self-help community. And you attract the sorts of people who are attracted to self-help communities. And then 10 years later, when someone asks, hey, shouldn't we go back to being pure truth seekers? It's a very different community that discusses the answer to that. I don't know. Uh, another one of my hypotheses as for why we're not winning is just that we kind of fail to work effectively in groups. Someone brought that up in the comments on Sailor Vulcan's post, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, research shows that effective groups of average workers outperform geniuses, which is kind of the whole idea behind why rationality could help someone succeed. Uh, geniuses who can't work effectively with other geniuses or with average workers in groups actually uh, perform worse than the effective average groups. And we demonstrated that with AIs, too, where in games, AIs beat humans. But if you combine a human and an AI and make them work together, they outperform the solo AIs. So I think if we want to win, that we do need to get better at this. And I don't think I, I wouldn't want to just throw the whole self-help angle under the bus. Is that a problem unique to our community? Or is that just like in general something that, we could, that we've identified as a weakness and that we, we have the capacity as rationalists to work on? Because, I mean, a lot of people, I think a lot of industries suffer from like the no, I'm better at this because I'm the smart one. Leave me alone. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, coordination where... is classically an incredibly hard problem. And you know, people have been trying to solve it for millennia. I think we might be a little worse than most groups at trying to solve it, though, because we're, we're more lots of introverted. People. Yeah, we're more introverted than, than the norm, and we're more like... Well, we have a lot of geniuses, and we have a lot of people that work solo yeah. and don't like to work in groups. And I think a lot of that comes from maybe the atheist community, uh, people that have deconverted from group thinky type uh, groups yeah. are just naturally suspicious of wanting to, you know, do team building and, and form a community that's kind of church-like. Um, and I understand that, but I think that we shouldn't let that, like, come between us and, you know, performing effectively in groups, considering that performing in groups is a really major, uh, you know, hack <laughs> yeah, I think you I, I agree with everything you just said that it th this is something that we've identified as a failure of our community and we're smart enough to realize it, we should be smart enough to do something about it. It's hard to know what to do. Um it's I all... mean, th th we are comprised of a lot of thing-oriented people and someone at one point on the last wrong uh, had mentioned that uh <laughs> that was unfortunate phrasing, but we really need more stereotypically feminine women in our community. But like what they mean is we need more people-oriented people. We need more of like people geniuses who are really good at running groups. But again, that runs into the issue of, first of all, how do we get them interested in rationality because they aren't now? How do we market ourselves? And then secondly, if we do start getting a lot of the people who like doing team building and community stuff, like, are they going to shift our, you know, focus away from epistemic rationality towards the self-helpy sorts of things or whatever else? And for that matter, would we listen to them? Because I still, you know, get shivers of you when I think about doing things in group that feel any at all like church, you know? Or, or like the military, like anything that is meant to help people coordinate, sort of, I have an allergic reaction to, which <laughs> is bad. Well, when you're coordinating, you're giving up your... Autonomy. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say that, but you're, you're giving it up in the sense as long as you want to keep cooperating. Mm -hmm. You like, you still have it, you can leave, but then you're, if you're exercising your autonomy, then you're not coordinating with the group. Part of that is going to be like, look, just trust me and do it. And that's never something that I think our community will be receptive to. Maybe. Yeah, prove yourself first. <laughs> uh, I consider trust me to be the magic words that always mean don't trust this person. Right. As soon as you hear those words, it's like, uh-huh. Unless it's believe me. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he said making small hand gestures. Um, yeah, I don't think we can solve that right away. But that's definitely... Identifying I don't, I know that there are people... a problem is the first step. Yeah, and I think it's it's been identified, and I like that it's being broadcast. And there are people working on ways around it. Or at least, like, part of it, I think one thing are that would there? help a lot... Well, there's, there's CIFAR, there's group houses, there's like unschooling centers that people are kind of talking about. I'm not sure if they've actually taken steps to making any of them yet, but... Well, and, and just like serious conversation about getting rid of the the allergy to having leadership in the community. Yeah, like solstice. Yeah. You know, one, one reason I think that it's hard to get people to rally behind it, because like if we had an obvious or several obvious um, case examples of 
again, torturing the baseball analogy, but like awesome home run hitters. Like, look, I've been crushing it left and right. I can show you how to. That sounds like the title of a self-help book. But uh, if there were people from the rationalist community who, who were big and had a platform um, that, could, that could be models for success if you do this stuff right, then I think that would go some distance. Yeah, maybe we just need better PR. Better PR, better, bigger, you know, more high name or more high, high profile names. Um, more people willing to put the label rationalist on things that they do. Yeah. And, you know, it's nice hearing, you know, I, I just, because I was, I've been reading Sam Harris's books since he started writing them in what, 2004 or five. Mm -hmm. And in the last few years, he's been taught, you know, he, 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 he drops terminology from the lesser wrong community. He, and then he, you know, he's openly talked about, you know, concerns from AI and talking with Eliezer Yudkowsky and, this and that. And this was somebody who's already a high profile figure who, you know, got into this stuff, learned from, learned all the, and was otherwise, well, you know, smart and respected and got into rationality and then came to the same conclusions of the, the concerns of the community shares about, you know, AI and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, effective altruism. He had McCaskill on too. So it's uh that's that's one way to go or at least one thing that would be nice yeah if if elon musk got in front of a microphone tomorrow and said yeah the reason that i you know am a, a billionaire is because i was a big fan of less wrong that'd be kind of cool um so we've seen people to do that so i think he's been doing his business thing since before less wrong was yeah. A thing, yeah. Though. yeah that, that kind of comes back to the issue though that i meant elon musk like figures okay yeah <laughs> although he could <laughs> say the reason that i'm not bankrupt yet or something right i don't know he wouldn't say that but <laughs> something like that right he might say the reason i got kicked out of ceo of tesla is <laughs> <laughs> i don't mean to cut you off sorry oh that's okay it was um i was thinking about there was some post on social media recently where somebody had been writing about uh, Bill Gates and Elon Musk and a bunch of other people, you know, they don't slack off. They get up early every day and they read the news and they're always working. And if you had their work ethic, you could do awesome things too. And That's uh, bullshit. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because I, I mean, forget awesome who brought it up. Helps, but... Well, I, I forget who brought it up, but there, there are also geniuses. I mean, some people do start off at different levels and I'm, I'm never going to become Elon Musk. I'm never going to be as good an engineer, regardless of how many hours in the day I have. Well, not with that attitude. With these, <laughs> no. with these nine simple steps, you sure can. Ooh, well, in, me that in addition to being <laughs> geniuses and having a good work ethic, they also got lucky. I mean, there's other people as yeah. genius as them out there who didn't. And there's people doing work. their laundry and buying their groceries. And, you know, they're freed up from a lot of stuff that people have to do as well. Yeah. So that's worth considering. Even just like, you know, not being a third, living in the third world or you know, being impoverished or being sick. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah health is huge. Well, and, and like you said, the slack that you get from being able to spend all the time you want doing real stuff and not spending four hours a day doing menial tasks like the rest of us or 10 hours a day if you go to work, right? Mm -hmm. Like what are we supposed to do in our free time? It's hard to do things in your free time when you're burnt out too. That's, that's exactly. That's the point I was going to go into next was that there is something to be said about the, the work ethic slash motivation. You know, I remember there was a, uh, some, talking head thing of Elon Musk 10 years ago or so where he was talking about how he one of the things he realized when he was working on as you know a younger engineer was like I realized I could get twice as much done if I just worked 80 hours a week rather than 40 like my competitors yeah. I could work at the same rate and finish twice as much and it's like sure Elon you can just say that <laughs> and you you can have what it takes to work 80 hours a week but like most of us don't and just not having you know enough fuel in the tank to do that is something that slows at least slows me down yeah. I, had, I had a friend who you know he, uh, eh, long story short, he was a very energetic guy. I mean, he, he was just, you know, always able to do things. And I would look at this guy and be like, man, if I had his energy, I could take over the world. <laughs> and while that might not be literally true, I feel like I could get a lot more done if I wasn't, you know, just a lot of us are just tired. And if you, if you are some freak of nature like Elon Musk and you don't get tired, or it takes <laughs> you three times as long to get tired, then you can get three times as much done. Yeah, Mental disorders mess with you a lot too. Yeah, or... Well, or guess, physical disorders. Yeah, exactly. And there's something the opposite of mental disorder. I don't think it has a word because it's not the kind of thing you go to a doctor to get diagnosed. But if you just happen to be three times as happy as everybody else, you, or you know, three times as energetic, and it's not disrupting your life, that's that opposite of disorder. It's still a, that's what I meant by geniuses. Yeah. I'm not referring to raw IQ. I'm referring to maybe just like has more motivation than average. Okay. Yeah. Then that's I would. That's a that's different a kind different of uses. That's a definition of the f term genius that I think is very un... Um... Well, it's just for lack of a better word. I don't know what, what else you would use to describe someone that has the opposite of a mental disorder, like what you were saying. Lucky sons of bitches, maybe. <laughs> like, uh, genetically gifted or... LSOBs, we can just call them that. No. 
<laughs> oh, oh, okay. Like, yeah, lucky son of a bitch. Yeah, I mean, like, Yukowski might be someone who's a classically uh, a genius, but suffers from motivational issues, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know where he's at with managing that in his life now, but I remember, at least in some of his posts, he's talked about that being a, a blocker for him. Yeah. And, I mean, if something like modafinil 2.0 was the cure that you could just drink every morning and have no no downsides from... Please, someone have... invent modafinil 2.0. Mm-hmm. And someone a... in our community, anybody who's listening to this, I want it. I'll buy it. <laughs> and yeah, if, and if you need to have a bunch of modafinil 1.0 to do it, then then do that. But we'll call it rationalonium, so people will <laughs> never miss the connection. <laughs> so it's gonna have a picture of Harry Potter, James Evans, <laughs> right. snapping his fingers on the bottle. Yes. Perfect. And I mean, so I I don't want to belabor that too much or use that as a cop out, but I don't want to dismiss that as a big factor that we don't all have the the factor the the luck the prior powers that people like elon musk and bill gates have right i don't think we all have to be like them just being able to be better than we would otherwise is a win yeah but we would be winning harder if we were all if we had whatever that is right i mean i guess that's true but everyone would be winning harder if they were better smarter faster and stronger well that's why i think uh combating acrasia and then also coming up with the modafinil 2.0 or whatever important steps uh important problems that we haven't really devoted as much time or attention to yeah that's something else we should be working on. And I'm going to say we and not me because <laughs> right. someone else who has the time and energy and money to do it. So We in the you sense. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm planning on actually uh, going to school for clinical research because oh, cool. I do actually want to try to develop new drugs and new like medical technologies. That sounds awesome. Yeah. The closest I know to somebody doing that was somebody I knew who was really into psychedelics when they were like in their early 20s and wanted to go learn everything about that. Now they're like a biomedical science person. <laughs> biomedical pharmacologist or something awesome. well, doing psychedelics did have something to do with uh it, it was i had the idea before then but like i've always been fascinated with drugs and the way you can when you break the brain you can really kind of like see how it works and realize this is just a computer mm-hmm. in some sense that like you can actually you can you can fix this you can make it better than it was that's a that's an important insight that yeah if you're if you're starting from like well this is what i've got to work with then that's realizing that that's a defeatist attitude not a realistic one is an important insight I like the insight that the reason people see spirals so much when they're on psychedelics is because that's literally how the, the retina is wired into the visual part of the brain. Yeah, it's super cool. Like You, you can actually start to see uh, like your own cognitive biases in a way. And just like, for example, um, I combined two drugs that I shouldn't have at one point, Don't. and I <laughs> got like really high and weird, but I started being able to see how my visual system worked. I saw like what it looked like lots of photos every time I would move my eyes. And I realized how much blank space that there was. I was like, how do people do anything? How do we see? How do we drive? This is, <laughs> we're, we're like really bad at seeing yeah. so you noticed <laughs> and the, processing. You were able to like see that when you move your eyes, your vision blacks out for a second. Yeah, I saw like there. saccades of, of images and what, um, there, there was so much blank space. I could see all the space that was missing in my peripheral vision. Oh my God. What were you on, if you don't mind? Um, I, I combined a prescription drug with, a, I think it was Cemex and Modafinil <laughs> and there might've also been caffeine. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly what the combination was that messed me up. Cimax? Cimax is a, a, what is it, a peptide nootropic. It's a Russian-developed drug. Okay. Interesting. It's pretty good. Um, so it's I, I it's thought more you were difficult just... to get now that serotropic doesn't exist anymore, but you can buy it from Russia. I thought you were going to say, like, you know, something in mushrooms, but these weren't even psychedelics. These no, were this was enough. a nootropic. Interesting. Okay. And a pretty good one. If you like modafinil, you might like Cimax. And if you don't, if you don't stack them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, don't stack things. <laughs> I think Scott had warned about that too. That's a tangent. But if you take nootropics, probably don't stack them together. I did want to also point out uh, the rash- the last rationalist on his blog also replied to this and uh, addressed a like the where they view the root of this coming from. Because the whole rationalist should win thing is from a, a post in, in, during, in the sequences. Uh, so the last rationalist says, Rationality is systemized winning is a slogan that was adopted to patch a bug in human cognition. Namely, our endless capacity to loot oursel- delude ourselves about how we did in an attempt to save face. Because, you know, it's really easy for someone to say, look, all my plans were great, the expected utility of this plan was great, but it just failed because of bad luck. And really, what a rational agent, um, a rational agent is an agent that always chooses the action that maximizes expected performance, right? You can't always know how something is going to happen, but you know that you should always bet on black over double zero because half the items are black on the roulette wheel where there's only one double zero uh, assuming that they pay out the same which different conversation entirely and elias objected to that uh, saying that in practice this always leads to people saying 
my expected performance was great. I just got unlucky this one time, which was how, why he went with the slogan, rationalists should win. That if you're losing a lot, that's a sign, and uh, rationalists should should be winning overall. And I think there's some truth to that. There like, is. The, the, the idea that, oh, I'm a great rationalist, but my life's in shambles and I can't get anything together. Um, you're doing something wrong, I mean, probably. yeah, it, you don't have to be a, a professional pilot or helicopter pilot to see, like, if you see, a, you know, one crash in a tree, like, oh, that guy probably screwed up. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, or, like, maybe that was their best emergency landing or whatever, but the, that's the parable, right? Like, you don't have to be an expert to see, like, oh, yeah, if you knew what you were doing, that wouldn't have happened. But then yeah. people always, like, get into arguing about why don't rationalists win? Like, every single time something comes up, it's like, well, rationalists aren't at the top of this. Why aren't rationalists winning? Well, maybe we're just not that good at rationality. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, that could be one, too, but... I think it's more like the question is, uh, as Eliezer said, what wins systematically? And then let's define rationality to that. What decision algorithm, when it's implemented, will win more than any other? And As like, opposed to, you know, have you won in every single goal that you've sought to go after? Yeah, and if there was, like, a community of people that was... I think that was uh, Seller Vulcan's uh, argument, saying that, like, you know, there are people that are winning at business, or there's people who are better super forecasters, although somebody argued in the comments that actually they had met a bunch of super forecasters and they were rationalists but oh they were <laughs> but yeah oh. that, that was the um sailor vulcan's whole argument was like but we're not doing instrumental rationality as well as we're doing epistemic because we should be looking at what these people are doing and figuring out how to do it ourselves yeah but i think we, well we talked about that a bit that a lot of a lot of the success of those like individual cases was like luck or you know having a huge safety net or something right i can afford to take a a, a million dollar gamble if i have 400 million dollars left yeah um i think the other issue is like things like prediction markets aren't something that interests me personally i'm not gonna mm -hmm. go um bet on things like they were saying well why aren't we all just betting on you know prediction markets that that does that just doesn't interest me <laughs> yeah well, it might be a good same. idea to do but like I, it might be a good idea to go start a business um and i probably could run a pretty good business based on like you know what i've learned from rationality etc I, I just don't want to yeah, I think that's that gets into like the metrics of how you measure this sort of thing. You know, if it's just having a lot of money and being happy, then and people define success differently. Yeah. So like saying that it's winning, like I think a lot of people kind of automatically jump to, well, why aren't rationalists winning at these things? And they're you know not really looking down at why aren't you winning at whatever you value? Right. Why yeah. aren't rationalists winning at being rich and famous and in power? And, and like it's also hard to tell who's not failing. Yeah, who's and that, avoiding that, failure. Exactly, and that's why I like. I mean not failing is a lower bar than winning but it is a kind of winning you can't you can't keep playing if you lose mm -hmm. so i mean it's i don't know getting better at that seems like a win and that doesn't that doesn't put you you know at the top of society unless you're trying to get there or something but yeah i mean i i'm i've got this thought half baked in my head that i'm trying to to verbalize while it while it's coming together and that's not going to work so i'll uh I, it's not quite coming together for me, but it, something along the lines of like there there are examples of people that are kicking ass in the sense of winning, and why aren't more rationalists doing that? But I don't know if they're all following a kind of like similar techniques that we're all that we all don't have. I I would I I would suspect that many of the like winning cases of people, you know, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, or whatever, they had some prior things in common, they had some luck factors in common, and now they have now they have outcomes that are similar, but. Those aren't the kinds of things, some of them aren't anyway, the kinds of things that you can just have. Again, Elon Musk's work ethic is something that I just don't have. Can I point out what I think is a example of rationalists winning on the small scale a lot? Totally. Please do. Okay. Uh, boot camps. Because right now, absolutely everybody goes to college, which is, you know, driving the price of college up insanely high and also leaving all these people with tons of debt. And they've gone through four years of schooling, which is sometimes spending a lot of time and money on things they don't necessarily need. Whereas the boot camps, I, I first really heard them pushed in the rationalist circle, and they're kind of ideal for people who have the rationalist neurobiology, because we're all already somewhat analytical and, and thinking in those terms anyway that make for good uh, coders. And the boot camp gets you in there, teaches you the things you really need to go out and start a job, it uh, doesn't cost that much, doesn't take, you know, relative to college, doesn't take that much of your life relative to college again, and you can right away get out the door and start at a pretty decent income, like generally starting at 60000 which is much more than an entry position is in almost any other industry, and move, you know, just move up from there. It, it seems like this is a small-scale win for a lot of rationalists, and, I mean, the community kind of found it by itself. 
That's what I did, and it was a pretty large scale win to me. Yeah. That's um, what I'm gonna do. <laughs> yeah, clinical it, research is uh, also a boot camp. What is the clinical research? Oh, yeah. uh, program is a boot camp as well. And I think that's the way to go. Maybe you know. So it's one of those just kind of identifying a failure mode in the way that things are usually done, and saying, "Nah, fuck that. What's a better way to do it?" Not well. Here's what everyone's doing. I guess I'll just do that too. Yeah. And you know, people would argue that there's other benefits to college or something, but I don't know if those benefits are worth, you know, $80,000 worth of debt. So, yeah. um, you know, if you can go to a boot camp for ten or $20,000, yeah, that's that's a big chunk of change. You need to have that, you know, ready or be able to get a, lo get a loan for it or something. But the idea that you can go through, knock this thing out in three or four months, and then hopefully start working and being able to to earn that money back very quickly. It's the the kind of munchkin-y shortcut that sounds like right up our alley, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and it works. It, it, yeah, there's, there's the, large successes from it. One of the things that I also think boot camps have over traditional schooling is that there's a goal at the end of it. Like if you're going to a coding boot camp, you're being specifically trained to work. The reason that people want to hire people who come out of boot camps is because they know that they've been specifically trained on like Python or whatever they need, uh, clinical research. Um, yeah. And school you know if you go to a four-year college uh, you do learn a lot of other stuff and that's cool it's great for personal development um but it, you don't come out of college necessarily trained to go right into a career I've, i wasn't at all i got an art degree i wasn't trained to be an artist i had to teach myself how to be an artist they didn't teach you anything about pricing or about getting clients or about marketing yourself it was like it, uh, it was terrible <laughs> whereas in a boot camp they do teach those things i i don't, I don't know about art boot camps but in the i don't coding think there is an art to. boot camp but i feel like there should be there, there, you there, could that's start an untapped an art market camp. there you go oh, i don't want to run a business though. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean part of what they do less so at the boot camp i went to but more at others they do focus on resume development and practicing interviews and like here's how to get a job because that's what you're here for yeah you're not you're not here to learn the fundamentals of computer science and learn you know the history how, how to write how, how to <laughs> the computer yeah the history of the computer <laughs> you know here's you know the the long definition of a touring machine here's ada lovelace's birthday like you're not here to memorize a bunch of i don't know if it's that trivial but like a lot I of other classes are it's... you look at you look at dates of famous scientists or something right so none of that bullshit in a boot camp they, but the, what they well, you're in there to get a job and the boot camp looks good if a lot of the graduates get high paying jobs so they want you to do that it's one of those great reciprocal relationships where what makes them look good and what they want is also great for you college i think is less focused on that because it's it's a great it's a prime example of a lost purpose i do have one final quote from uh this from the last rationalist reply it's kind of a long one though if you guys want to let me okay um, the, so this is in reply to Eliezer saying that rationality is more li like systematized winning. Last rationalist says, systematized winning is not an actionable definition. Most domains already have field specific knowledge on how to win. And in aggregate, these organized practices are called society. The most powerful engine of systemized winning developed thus far is civilization. Most people trying to explain the value of rationality assume that there is such a thing as instrumental rationality, methods to systematically win over and above the usual practices of civilization. If someone asks, look, if I go to college and get my degree and I go start a traditional family with four kids and I make 120k a year and vote for my favorite political party, and the decades pass and I get old but I'm doing pretty damn well by historical human standards just by doing everything society would like me to do, what use do I have for your rationality? Why should I change any of my actions from the societal default? You must have an answer for them. Saying rationality is systematized winning is ridiculous. It ignores that systematized winning is the default. You need to do more than that to be attractive. I think the strongest frame you can use to start really exploring the benefits of rationality is to ask yourself what advantage it has over societal defaults. When you give yourself permission to move away from the systematized winning definition, without the fear that you'll tie yourself in knots of paradox, it is then that you can really start to think about the subject concretely. So I guess my ultimate question is, what advantages does rationality have over societal defaults? All right, who wants to go first? I'll go first because I already said my answer. My first one that comes to mind anyway is that it helps. It's the art of not losing. I think there's a post related to this. There definitely is a post related to this that uh, not sucking is more generic than like six, like than being great at what you do. Um, but just the the ability to identify weaknesses in your plans and in your uh, your steps is immeasurably valuable. Mm -hmm. I think that that I mean there are probably definitely other avenues that teach that sort of thing, but it's one thing that I've noticed from it. I when I think about how am I going to address this problem. I have inner dialogues that I ask myself questions like, what if this happens? How, what, you know, are you sure you're not just thinking about it, you know, because it makes you feel good. All of the, the ways that, you know, whether it's, it's a failure mode of just like making a wrong bet or, 
uh, whether that's like buying a bad lottery ticket or running a red light or something, or just uh, falling into the trap of believing something because it feels good or, you know, slipping into a, a bias or something like that, right? It gives me, I keep picturing bumpers like when you're bowling. <laughs> you know, putting up those bumpers doesn't make you hit strikes, but it, it keeps your ball on the track and you're going to hit a pin, right? Whereas otherwise it could go off at any point on the track. That's a really bad analogy, but that's what I've been picturing this whole time. That, that works. Um, that's a good analogy. So yeah, for, for me, I would say that it, it trains you on how to inflate those little bumpers that they use to get the bowling ball on the track. <laughs> I'm enjoying the metaphors. Um, I like your answer. Uh, that's a good consequentialist answer because I guess um, people who are thinking about rationality being systematized winning, it's kind of a, oh, like, why aren't we all Elon Musk? But you have to think about, well, even if uh, just like the marginal utility you would get from in increasing everybody just like a few steps up from where they are now in the world, kind of like related to, I guess, the idea of raising the sanity waterline, how much better would the world look if fewer people were losing? And maybe that's something that we should be focusing on more. Maybe that's even a more achievable goal. Um, my answer, I think, just comes down to picking good problems to work on by knowing what's true. And that's still going to be different for different people, like we were talking about before. You know, you, you get to pick what your definition of success is. But, like, say that a lot of people have the goal of improving society, which I think is a pretty common goal. Uh, they'll be better able to achieve that goal if they know true things about what a good society looks like what actions actually improve it, and how not to delude themselves into thinking that they're pursuing this goal when they're not. If they have that knowledge, they'll do better at improving society than they would if they went with the societal defaults. Yeah, I like that a lot. And, you know, a societal default might be, sure, you, you know, had your four kids, your 120K or whatever, but you spent 80 of that getting an education that you didn't really need. So, you know, you, what how, what would you have won if you'd done a boot camp instead to get into your career? You would have won $60,000. Yeah. Um, and three years of your life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. And societal default right now is you get to about 75, 80 years old and you die. Right. So fuck that too, right? Yeah. yeah. So maybe there's, maybe there's a, uh, a separate thing there. I don't want to try and sneak two answers in, but the... This isn't really so much of something that you get. This is just a, a viewpoint that you're, but at least one thing I got, I've, I've got out of this approach, this rationalist, rationalist approach to life is not being content with like the way things are basically transhumanism. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was already into that before this, but it was a, it was the best defense I've come across with the whole thing. And the idea that in transhumanism for, well, I guess transhumanism in for people, but the, for society as well, for, for the world, you can look at this and say, no, we can do better. Rather than say, how can I make what they're, you know, you can build better mousetraps rather than, uh, or you can figure out other ways to solve the mouse problem than just build better mousetraps. It's maybe the analogy. The the skill set to say, no, I'm going to start from scratch. Or what's what's another... <laughs> Let's make everybody Elon Musk. Right. That's, with that's, that's better the, drugs or exactly. with, uh, you know, uh, genetic engineering. Yeah. Rather than teach everyone to just do what they can with what they've got, we could say, no, we can give you more. Right? Just, just the ability to do more start from scratch questions. Of course, delivering on those is, is something that we need to start doing, but uh, I think it's valuable to at least say, no. I think we need more time. <laughs> we, we need more time. <laughs> and we need more members. But, you know, imagine like if all the, the, the progress in transportation had just been building faster trains and nobody thought about building planes, right? Like this, this is the kind of thing that's like, no, we can, we can build planes too. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping my metaphor is just landing because I don't know how to elaborate yeah, No, you have it, to be so. able to pick good goals. Right. Like, and, uh, do what 80,000 Hours is doing and, okay, like, let's actually assign people the career of identify priorities. Yeah, no, totally. All right, oh. what's your secret answer, Inyash? Uh, so my secret answer is kind of, it's very related to your guys' answer, <laughs> uh, in part being that um, lots of times, okay, so th what, what people really want is to be right, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and society has a lot of defaults and you if you follow them, generally you'll be okay but there's a lot of ways for people to fool themselves into thinking they're right and for society to fool itself into thinking that things are going just fine when they really aren't. And I think rationality is the, the art of noticing when you're wrong and allowing your, yourself to be made right by the facts of the world instead of trying to argue vehemently that you're actually right and you were right all along or that society is just fine and there's no problem with AI and you guys are all, you know, crazy chicken little sky is falling type of people. It's, it's the practice of really looking at things and updating yourself when the evidence is against you. And so I think it comes back to the whole truth seeking aspect of things, not trying to deny how things actually are 
and changing changing yourself being proven right by changing yourself so that you now have the right position as opposed to arguing that things were right all along and i think the society has a lot of problems with that too that saying no we're fine you know america is the greatest or we don't have any problem with this <laughs> drug use or whatever yeah, my, my facts are the right facts yeah yeah exactly or my facts are just as good as yours right yeah the the actually evaluating facts and being able to say i these facts are right and these so-called facts are wrong and there's already an enterprise that does that but one of the po one of the a strong posts we might talk about if there's time today deliberates on that a bit that like science already tries to do that right mm -hmm. and scientists try to do that as people mm -hmm. and yet it's possible to be a scientist with a phd and a job and everything and still think the earth is 10,000 years old. Should we segue right into the rest long posts then? If you're if you're ready. I mean, that was a great segue, but uh, I'm done here, but do you guys have other things to say as well? No, let's move on. No, okay. I, I think that was a good, uh, good segue. Okay, cool. So okay. that brings us directly into our less wrong posts section of the show. Woo. Okay, our two less wrong posts this month, or this episode, were some claims are just too extraordinary and outside the laboratory. Steven, you were just talking about outside the laboratory, but let's start with some claims that are just too extraordinary because chronologically that one came first. Totally. Okay, cool. Um, so some claims are just too extraordinary. Okay, is a post about the nature of evidence and how it relates to extraordinary claims. And sort of a defense, a defense of the hubris of science. Yes. Yeah, if you want to call it hubris. Rather, defending that what science is isn't hubris. Exactly. The post basically says that some claims are really absolutely extraordinary. It starts off with a quote from Thomas Jefferson, who says, I would sooner believe that two Yankee professors would lie than that stones would fall from heaven. Uh, and that was his uh, take on meteors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the, the post points out that there is a, a method of getting to the truth that is optimized for weeding out false claims and so it counts as extraordinary evidence and can thus substantiate extraordinary claims like rocks fall out of the sky the quote that i pulled from this is a replicated scientific report is a special kind of extraordinary claim designed by the surrounding process to be more extraordinary evidence than simple verbal claims it is more extraordinary evidence because the surrounding process, and I would place a far greater premium on replication than on peer reviews, by the way, is constructed to deny entrance to claims that are in fact false. In this way, the replicated scientific report becomes capable of overcoming greater burdens of prior improbability. So yeah, it, it was basically a post on why science, scientific evidence can be trusted, right? Yeah. And I think I had that joke before about, like, I won't take your word for it that werewolves exist, but if you brought me a dead werewolf, I'd believe you. That's sort of the extraordinary evidence to, to substantiate that extraordinary claim, and that's what science does. Yeah. And I want to reiterate that when I said that there's already an enterprise that sort of does the truth-seeking thing, that's what science does. But they do, I think, in my experience of not being a, a real scientist, they focus less on, like, the self-improvement part of science. Like, you know, it's, it's less important that, like, you're a, a better and more updated and well well rounded calibrated. calibrated person just more that your test results are accurate um whereas rationality is like no it can be about you too there's a virtue of rationality but there's a practice of science maybe mm -hmm. there are virtues of science i don't know but yeah science does double blind uh which you know shows that they have some awareness of the fact that we delude ourselves that there's been a lot more work on that like pretty recently too true uh replication crisis and yeah i found it interesting that he posted in here that he puts far greater premium on replication than on peer review and this was before the replication crisis where he said you know peer review is okay and all but i the reason i i point this out is because uh i was you know part of the whole atheist scene during the early days and whenever people tried to bring about you know like i know that god existed because i saw my mother being healed from whatever she had I, the one of the go-to replies was that's great but that's your anecdotal evidence which i don't believe because you're easily fooled is it you know has it been published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal and there was always this focus on peer-reviewed and apparently that has not really been high enough of a bar Pe lots of things get past peer review because people are just sort of reviewing what you said right and having the having things actually be replicated is where the big deal is and that's where we got the replication crisis when people started trying and failing to replicate things and to be fair peer review is a higher standard than most people hold themselves to <laughs> yes. right so 
Um, most people just allow themselves license to believe whatever they want. They don't even ask their friends or their, their trusted smart allies to, to corroborate. Mm-hmm. Um, so doing that, at least science is ahead of the curve there, but it's not high enough. They can do better. And I specifically remember because I multi- many times myself said, you know, peer-reviewed scientific journal, and then I felt stupid. Yeah, because... I used to do that, too. I would specifically focus on the peer review aspect. I don't even know why. Probably just because I heard so many other people say that. Right. It was a teacher's password. Yep. Yeah. Well, and, and the to the thing of scientists having double blind so they can correct for their own biases, that's true. But they but it's possible to do that as merely a thoughtless ritual and not do that as, like, a cognitively sapient person, right? Mm-hmm. Or, again, the, the, the scientist who can fully believe in whatever magic bullshit they want, but get papers published because they're, they're doing the rituals, right? Yeah. That's where the next post comes in. Um, but I won't skip straight there, but let's I'd, see. I did really like the Thomas Jefferson quote because like th- there, there were three quotes at the beginning of this post and the latter two were both posted very approvingly. And when I first read that Thomas Jefferson quote, I was like, ah, ha ha, that's funny. Look at how wrong he was. But after I read the post, I went back and read that quote again. And I think that was also meant to be an, an approving quote like this is the correct way to do science like thomas jefferson heard from two guys that rocks fell out of the sky and that was not good enough for him and yeah it really shouldn't have been but the scientific method does exist and so people manage to replicate this and at this point in time no one doubts that rocks fall out of the sky we all know about meteors because science has proven it and over and over and I don't know if Thomas Jefferson lived long enough to actually see that proven by science, but you know the fact remains that he might have been convinced eventually well, as enough scientific evidence accumulated because scientific evidence is a very special kind of evidence that will convince you know any anyone in time. Uh, of, of I, the... I wish it would convince anyone in time. Well, it should. Anyone, anyone who's trying to be 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 yeah. accurate. Yeah. Be, like taking the evidence in good faith. Yeah. yeah, what you're saying is that Jefferson's rejection of of the meteorite hypothesis was it was correct, fu- fully fully reasonable from where he's at, and it yeah. might have been unreasonable for him to hear this from two people and be like, "That's it, I I believe that rocks fall out of the sky now," because all he's had is just two anecdotes, yeah. or rather anecdotes from two people. Right. Right. Well, specifically from two professors, which I think is pe- an important part of that too. Um, when we were talking about a uh, peer review versus um, double blinding or versus you know replication. Uh, the people who are peer reviewing you are also presumably experts in the field, but you're assuming that that means that they're impervious to biases. They're not. Right. That's fair. Yeah. It's like argument from authority. Uh, yeah. Jefferson accurately, you know, correctly applied Occam's razor there. Yeah. Yeah. And he happens to land on the wrong side of the, the, the position, but that's because he had, he was using the best tools he had at the time. Yeah. But you have to imagine that if he had been presented with evidence, he would have said, Oh, now I have the evidence. So I'll update in favor of rocks falling from the heavens. There you go. And I mean, that that wasn't just a thing that happened back then. Continental drift wasn't really accepted until, what, the late 50s, early 60s? Up until that point. There's still people alive today who, you know, thought that the Earth was an unchanging, solid thing and had to be convinced over a period of time with the accumulation of evidence that, no, it actually moves and changes, which is kind of fucking crazy if you think about it right the only reason it doesn't seem crazy is because we all already know it and accept it there's a lot of uh, wisdom to draw from that last sentence that sure you know science is uh it i guess you see that all the time where people don't give science all the credit it deserves because it's like oh of course we already knew that like stuff's made of atoms and that uh germ theory of disease yeah (laughs) exactly the germs are real or something because we are we're all taught that in elementary school but it's like yeah but this was hard to figure out and this wasn't this wasn't born knowledge that our, our species had from the beginning, right? This was hard won. Yeah. yeah. You see a lot of people kind of look back in history and laugh at how dumb everybody was. And it's like, you're standing on the shoulders of giants right now. <laughs> you yeah. would have believed exactly the same shit. Exactly. And I think it's it's hard to, uh, you know, I can't remember. I read Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything like 10 years ago. Which is not very short. No, but it's it's a short... It's a, a <laughs> short nearly everything. Yeah, nearly everything. <laughs> Comparatively. <laughs> but he did talk about continental drift. And I know that like the fact that the continents look like puzzle pieces that was slid together wasn't lost on people through the 50s. Mm-hmm. I don't know how they rationalized that 100 years ago. How that could be a coincidence. How unlikely is it that the Earth has moved so that these massive landmark uh, masses have moved away from each other? Well, but it's it becomes more likely that that's the case I mean, every time you look perfect. at every time you look at the coasts of other continents and be like look those fit right together but they don't fit right together i mean there's been erosion and other stuff they they, they roughly fit together that explains fault lines yeah i guess I, it it's one of those things that i think that was one of the the fact that they 
look like they aren't just random shapes, you know, with relation to each other, was, was... That was another piece, but it was, you know, it wasn't determinate. No, 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 it couldn't be. That's not enough. You'd have to explain how this is happening and that, like, land isn't... I mean, everything about your senses and every experiment you can do without really good instruments tells you that the land is just sitting there and goes all the way to the center and it's just it's all it's land all the way down. How does how does this move like like a like well, something floating on the water, right? And even if it isn't land all the way down, how does just solid earth like this move? It's not like it's floating. Right. And even if it was floating, there's other earth pushing against it, holding it in place. So it challenges intuition. Yeah. But I guess for me, it was, I think that was always something that people would have had to answer going back 100 years ago, or up to up to a, whatever, 70 years ago, when they figured finally that they bought onto this tectonic plate slash uh, continental Cosmo. drift. They'd have to at least say, look, why do they look like they kind of fit together? And they can't just say, that's a coincidence. And maybe they did. They could. Yeah. But that seems, like a, that seems like a bad answer. And if anything, I that, mean, that's like, that would have been enough to incentivize people to keep looking into it and then come to the right answer. To me, that's like someone asking, well, why does that tree look like it like has a human face in it if it wasn't, you know, if it do doesn't take some essence from the body that is buried beneath it, right? It's like, look, the bark just happens to look like a human face. Yeah, there's a lot of things. But the answer to is it's probably just a coincidence. Mm. Or, or I, I it's a under, uh, not understood scientific phenomena that we can't like explain yet. It's always frustrating when you do have to give those answers to people. And it's not like the West Coast matches against Asia at all, right? Okay, yeah. You got to rotate some stuff. And <laughs> all right, yeah, that's fair. It's it's a funny puzzle, and it's not perfect, but yeah. it's yeah. It, it's 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 a hint. Yeah, it, it's a hint. That's that's what I was getting at. Thank yeah. you for distilling it down. It took me five minutes to get there. <laughs> Dark energy was also a thing that I I remember. Do you guys? Were you cognizant of science yet when uh, dark energy was discovered? I don't know about when it was discovered. I remember a lot of discussions around it, which okay. I guess continue to this day. It was the craziest fucking thing when, when people first discovered that the universe is actually accelerating. And, I mean, that, that was quite the talk of, of me and my friends at the time. Because this is a whole new force we'd never known about, right? I remember the buzz... And discussed at least in historical context in books by like Tyson and Hawking and stuff. Um, but none of us doubted it when we heard it. Well, this actually kind of brings me back to like I have this thought about the argument from authority that, um, and I think actually I think I brought this up on the podcast and received flack for it. Now that I think about it, maybe this was a blog post back when Do I had it a blog. Again. <laughs> yeah, um, that if Stephen Hawking says dark energy is real and here's why, I am fully justified in just believing him because he's an authority on it. Mm -hmm. What, what would be wrong for me to say is that it's true because he said it. What I, what I say instead is that I think Hawking says it because it's true. Yeah. And I, I am not equipped to challenge him on that. Yeah, I'd um, update more in favor of this being true because Stephen Hawking believes in it. Yeah. In fact, I would bet that he's right. I, I, I literally bet with my money. And if someone wants to take me up on that and then go prove Hawking wrong, they're welcome to. Um, so it's sort of just there's this – because this was like one of those things that – uh, you get a lot of easy practice at arguing with religious people in your teens. If you say, oh, well, you know, the, the si science says that the, you know, you say, you tell somebody, uh, a religious creationist that you're wrong, that the earth is 10,000 years old. And they say, well, you just believe that it's 14 billion years old because your scientists say it's 14 billion years old. Why do you believe them? That's an argument from authority too. Mm -hmm. You're claiming I'm being, using an argument from authority, just believing my favorite book. But it's a different kind of belief in authority. Yeah. It's, it's because like, it's, one, one has extraordinary evidence behind it. Right. They have this prestige that your book doesn't. And if they were, if there was um, some big update in the community, of the, you know, in the next 50 years, they discover something, you know, another weird force of nature or whatever. And it's like, holy shit, guys, the universe is probably closer to 50 billion years old. Then I'm going to start believing that. It'd be weird of me to stick with the, with the eld science of 1990 that said the universe is 14 billion years old, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a difference there in that it's flexible to the current consensus. And that consensus has huge incentives to be pushed more and more towards accuracy. Yeah, that's another, you know, uh, argument you can give to the person who says, well, you're just believing in your authorities. It's like, well, science isn't dogma. Right. Yeah. That's, that's never been good enough for them either. If yeah. they were, we would have, we would still be sitting on Aristotle's shoulders rather than on Newton's and Einstein's. Right. Yeah. So there's a reason that this, that this evidence is accepted more highly than just someone's word. And it's just the bizarre irony of having that argument online of <laughs> yeah. like look we're having this conversation at like the speed of light and one science of science works like yeah. we have mm -hmm. shot rockets into space we've cured diseases like you know what has the catholic church done we have absolutely not shot rockets into space because the earth is flat and okay. this is all a conspiracy <laughs> <laughs> i see <laughs> touche sir <laughs> walks away quickly <laughs> so uh it ends with the question 
What about journals that came to publish replicated res- reports of ESP? So extra sensory phenomena is that what the stands for it's yeah. been a long time so i know what esp is i just remember if i knew the acronym that's the idea that like i can read your thoughts yeah. or or you uh, can push things over with your brain or detect a tragedy on the other side of the world with a disturbance in the forest or something right um, it's like remote viewing yeah or something. all all the weird stuff that people are supposedly able to do in their heads yeah. that's um, just proof that uh scientists were you know fell fell prey to cognitive biases twice yeah or uh, motivated reasoning or whatever they wanted it to be true they you know like, is it, it, because it's... Um, Why are you rejecting it out of hand, though? Because it challenges everything else that we've uncovered through the laws of nature. But then we're just trusting other authority, <laughs> other other peer-reviewed papers, right? Right. Yeah, this was the kind of thing that, like, James Randi, I mentioned, I think, Project Alpha a couple episodes ago, where, you know, he sent in dummies to... Or not, he sent in students to go in to do more of, like, the same magic research that people like Uri Geller were being paid to do. Yeah. And at any point, if they were asked, are you, are you tricking us? They were supposed to say, yes, James Randi sent me. And they were never asked that. Because you get motiv- scientists are people, too. And, you know, they're motivated by the same things the rest of us are. Um, it'd be great if they were just, like, these super smart robots that were giving us, you know, just pushing out truth every time. Yeah. But they're, they're ans- asking their own questions and trying to answer them themselves. And the other problem, I think, with peer review is that, like, you could, you could get a peer-reviewed creationist journal, and I'm sure they exist, right. where a bunch of other deluded morons come together and say, and you know, nod their heads and well, say there, yes. there actually are peer-reviewed they, ESP journals. Yeah. yeah. So it, it has to be in the, the, the special community of real science. <laughs> but that, if that doesn't sound culty, I don't know what does. Yes. Right. So. And like, how are you defining your real scientist? Just because it was replicated, I'd still want to look at the study's design. Yeah. You like, was it double blinded? You know, um, yeah, okay. I did jump too hard on- onto dismissing it out of hand just because of what Stephen was just talking about. Like, we've seen this before. We know well, why this happens, but. Right. I would absolutely dismiss ESP out of hand, too. Uh, I just had to think for a while about why I would. I mean, I think part of it is because it directly contradicts a lot of things that are already far more better established about physics and how reality works. And because there are much uh, less unlikely explanations for those phenomena as well. Uh, the the explanation they give has has a better answer than uh, ESP exists. Yeah, it's easier to believe that some scientists deluded themselves than that ESP exists. It's kind of the same Jefferson answer. I, I'm still open to being proven wrong if they came to me with some extraordinary evidence. But... That's the thing. If like the entire scientific community were to be like, guys, dude, we were wrong. There is like this whole psi thing that taps into this other quantum dimension. And a few people have evolved, you know, enough to be able to influence it just slightly. And here's how it works. I'd be like, That'd holy be cool. shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they discovered another aspect of reality. That's awesome. And we'd all love that. And yeah. that was the, like, James Randi's million dollar prize was always like a... A little bit hopeful, right? Well, it, had, it, it was. It had a sharp and a dull edge. It was used as a weapon to call out charlatans. But it was also, like, if we ended up paying out this million dollars, we'd be stoked because we discovered something new. And I think, um, I think James, I think uh, Richard Dawkins asked James Randi, like, if you had this challenge, a set, you know, 120 years ago, wouldn't you have paid out if somebody was like using a radio? Hmm. And Randi thought about it and then said, yeah, I guess so. If somebody had invented a radio before they existed and was using it to win our, or to pass our, our judgment and our tests, then yeah, we would have paid out the million dollars. But then, hey, we would have been the ones to have demonstrated that radio existed and worked. Sure, mm-hmm. they invented it, but we were the ones... We would have happily paid out that million dollars. Yeah, and then you'd get the radio, you'd take it apart, you'd figure out how it worked, and then you'd have a radio 122 years earlier. Yeah. Which so would have been a big win. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so then the, then the the Today Analog would be like, what if somebody you know proved Psy or something through, through a similar thing? It's like, well, then we just helped discover or helped seriously validate a new discovery as important as something like that. Yeah. And so... At which point you can measure it, figure out what causes it. Yeah, exactly. Replicate it. Totally. So in that sense, um, I... Uh, like Damn the it. fact that you can't do anything with these supposed ESP powers except some occasional parlor tricks is really indicative. Right. And Yeah, ask Wild Bo what he'd do with it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, don't, because he'd probably just destroy the world with the <laughs> monsters. But, uh, uh... Yeah, the I think... Uh, man, I had something. I guess I was going to just reiterate that the point that, yes, uh, if science did come out and say, yes, uh, ghosts are real or something, we'd all be stoked on that. I'd be stoked. That means death is fake. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's always been my thing on ghosts, or at least for like the last 10 years. You know, I've, I've always, if, if ghosts are demonstrated to be real, I would be, I would be stoked. Um, but the thing is, A, I'm, I really want it to be real, so I need to be extra careful. And B, uh, I, I, because of that extra carefulness, I need to I have a very high standard of evidence. You know, if somebody, we went to a haunted house and a cup fell off a table, I wouldn't be like, oh my God, spirits are real. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I, you know, so like what would constitute proof for ghosts? Uh, like a number of people passing that Houdini uh, seance test, right? I don't know what this Houdini seance test so, is. So Houdini, every year, he, he'd said, hey, when I die, I gave my wife a password. You guys conduct a seance for me. And if, if the spirit in the room can tells her the password, she'll know it was me. Okay. Um, so they now, they still they keep doing the, on his birthday or on his death day or something, they do the seance every year. Oh, really? Um, I Wait, don't know if anyone alive... Does still have the password? That's what I was going to ask. I don't know if anyone alive has the password. But she like, must have passed it to her kids or something. But something like, you know, uh, if your grandma came back and, you know, it was like, hey, the combination that's safe in my closet is this. And then you went in and the safe actually opened. Or, you know, check behind my dresser. I dropped my diamond ring back there and it's back there. You know, just enough things that were verifiable communications from the afterlife that, that would be good evidence but you know a cold spot in a room no right <laughs> who, who even said ghosts are cold that was my that was one of my big gripes dead about people it people are cold yeah, sure but these aren't these aren't bodies right <laughs> if anything they're concentrations of energy which might be hot i don't know but this whole thing of like you know we were talking about uh oh before before we started recording about using like a heat gun or a thermal reading gun to read which parts of my rooms are drafty or something mm -hmm. if i see a cold spot over there how who decided that that, that that's a ghost <laughs> right. if anything a hot i think a hot spot is like just a prior eye to me more likely to be a ghost hmm. so what i'm getting at is that's bad evidence i would need good evidence like verifiable tests yeah i, I really like ghost hunters who have kind of just decided a bunch of okay like ghosts are this this and this so we're going to use these tools to find anomalies yeah <laughs> like like uh, you know ultra low frequencies yeah. or those radio scanners that just jump between the radio and like oh my god we just heard the word fuck that means <laughs> the ghost is mad at us <laughs> um you know th those those are if, if there was we don't know anything about ghosts so how how you know like we've never actually had any evidence of ghosts that we can say okay this is more or less likely to be a sign that this is a ghost <laughs> exactly i remember reading an interview with a surgeon who uh on like the top of a shelf in in the surgery um room or wherever yeah, it was they put, they put a card yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they put something and uh whenever anyone had an out of body experience they'd be like oh cool what did, what's what's that card say up there and they're like what what card i'm like oh you didn't actually see anything then <laughs> yeah you didn't see that put a jack of clubs up on top of the light yeah, yeah. i don't want to derail us but we we talked a bit about the the next post um or do we want to move on to that one officially yeah uh so this one was outside the laboratory and this one starts with the kind of tongue-in-cheek quote that outside the laboratory scientists are no wiser than anyone else mm -hmm. um and we should be very disturbed by that fact so we talked about a bit of we can kind of skim parts of this because a that's kind of true in some cases but as you Husky, i think eloquently puts that if that if if a scientist is only a scientist when they're wearing their lab coat they're not a real scientist yeah. they're they're following the rituals of science but they don't know they don't know why did you want to read his awesome apprentice shepherd analogy yeah also isn't there an audio version of this full story somewhere out there already i don't think there is actually didn't you do it i don't think i did i don't remember there being one though but uh, i feel like one should exist i mean i obviously we've all read it but uh i don't think i did an audio version of that no i will double check i think okay. you might have but i think you would know so. <laughs> <laughs> um so uh Suppose that an apprentice shepherd is laboriously trained to count sheep as they pass in and out of a fold. Thus, the shepherd knows when all the sheep have left and when all the sheep have returned. If you then give the shepherd a few apples and say, how many apples? And the shepherd stares at you blankly because they weren't trained to count apples, just sheep. You would probably suspect that the shepherd didn't understand counting very well, right? Yeah. And I think that's a great analogy. To the shepherd, it's just a ritual. He doesn't understand what numbers are. Exactly. And if it's if it's the kind of thing that they can only do in this one sense, where they're standing outside the the, fo the paddock or fold or whatever you call it, the, the cage of sheep, mm -hmm. when they're all leaving and coming back, and they can't do anything else, they don't they don't understand the principle. And they're not... So in this case, this this shepherd is not not a scientist, but not a real counter. Yeah. <laughs> Mathematician is probably too strong of a word, but... Um, I'm kind of just breaking my brain trying to think of like whether that would even be possible that someone could count sheep and not apples. Like, are they using a different kind of math? Well, no, you, you know that after two comes three, after three comes four, after yeah. four comes five. And then once the sheep start coming in, you go backwards. So it's just walking up and down, you know, a, a, a path, but it doesn't necessarily apply to apples, right? So... What I think you're saying, what Jess was saying, is that is that is that possible that a human could be that compartmentalized? And I don't know if it's possible with counting, if it's cognitively possible with humans, but it yeah. definitely is in other slightly more complex domains, yeah, right? It's obviously possible with um, science, <laughs> yeah, with beliefs about the world. But yeah, I think like math is, I don't know. I know we should just move on. That was just like <laughs> I was confused by that analogy because I was like, I don't think math works that way. No, I, I I see what you're I I like what you're saying though. Like, can you really be that broken? And maybe not that broken, but slightly less broken. Okay, it still makes for a very vivid analogy though. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of ruined it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I disagree. I, I I think it's fun to think about. So 
Yeah, I mean, is it a ritualized tradition for testing hypotheses experimentally? Like, why should you test them experimentally? Mm -hmm. um, if you're if you're a scientist and that's your job, that's why. Yeah. But if, if you're a lowercase s scientist and it's your job, that's why. If you're a capital S scientist and that's who you are, it's because you want to have an accurate map of the territory. Yeah. And testing is the only way to, to, to do that. Yeah. He, he has this thing that I sometimes quote, not verbatim, but uh, I, I make this analogy as well, that when you look down to see your shoes, to see if your shoelaces are untied, photons arrive from the sun, bounce off your shoelaces, strike your retina, are transduced into a neural firing, are reconstructed by your visual cortex into an activation pattern that's strongly correlated with the current shape of your shoelaces. <laughs> So to gain new information with the territory, you have to interact with the territory. His his thoughts are correlated with the, the photons, which are correlated with the shoelaces. There's this direct chain that ties everything together. Uh, there has to be some real physical process whereby your brain state ends up correlated to the state of the environment. To find things out, you have to go look. And then he goes on to say that, uh, what about a scientist who is competent in the lab, but outside believes in the spirit world? If he says something along the lines of, well, no one really knows, and I admit that I don't have any evidence, but a religious belief, it can't be disproven one way or another by observation, then uh, Leerza says, I cannot but conclude that this person literally doesn't know why you have to look at things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's the, that, that's, um, the puzzle that, that you're thinking about, Jess, when you brought up the, the counting person. Like, is it possible that they really... I, I don't know. I it sounds like he's being like... uncharitable, but it it might really be the case, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like maybe they just see apples and their brain just blanks. Like, no, that's not what you do with apples. You do that with sheep. <laughs> <laughs> apples are for eating. It's it's really frustrating that um, whole paragraph about the shoes and the sun and the photons because I wish there was a simple way I could use that when I argue with people who don't understand why you have to look at things. Like people who believe in ESP, it's like, well, there's like, a, what, what is your, you know, proposed mechanism for how you can communicate with someone on the other side of the world with your brain? Do you understand how matter works mm -hmm. <laughs> or energy or, or neurons? And like, they just don't, or they just don't care. And they're like, well, there's some kind of energy that does it. I'm like, no, that's not, we, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish I could just kind of quote this at them, but then like they, you know, you can't realistically, okay, let me get my phone pull up this sequence and uh, then I'm going to talk at you for a while and you're going to listen. <laughs> I can think of a really butchered way to do it, which is where you grab a coin and a gun, flip the <laughs> coin, oh catch it in your hand, don't show the person, and then say, is it heads or tails? If you guess wrong, I'm going to shoot you. And do you want to look first? <laughs> and if they say no, then they're being crazy, right? But if they say yes, then they're admitting to the value of looking at things, right? Yeah, but that's not how they think of looking at things. I, I have actually quoted this thing to someone before. I mean, I just remember the basic gist of it, you know? Did it work? Uh, I don't remember. Darn. Yeah. And I think it helped to illustrate a little bit more of what you know what i meant by entangling your beliefs with the physical world for virtue for the virtue of being right sure but i think that the literal gun to the head analogy yeah. does illustrate that like no look if you really won't don't want to get shot you have to like admit you you probably want to see what the coin came up right yeah it's not socially acceptable to point guns at people <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. maybe you could bet a large amount of money and i thought about that but know. the gun seemed to be more intense analogy yeah. but not 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 in real life but just the idea you could give this thought experiment to somebody you don't have to actually have a gun right yeah, yeah. so i guess yeah if you encounter someone that says that like i can do esp like me and my brother can communicate that's like okay um, I'll, I'll give you a hundred dollars if uh, you guys can communicate something i bet people money I've never had anybody take me up on it. Yeah. <laughs> but I've, I've also, back when they were doing it, uh, referred people to the James Randi challenge. And you can't just offer to give them $100. You have to get an actual bet. So they give you $100 as well if they lose. Right, yeah. And I will do like, hey, if you can do this, um, I'll give you $100. If you can't, you give me $10. Yeah. You know, I'll do a 10 to 1 bet with you as high as you want to go. Yeah. A um, 100 to 1 to 1 bet. Like, screw it. Let's do this. So, yeah, I think that's the the virtue i guess of literally putting your money where your mouth is i guess Making well your figuratively putting your, your money where your mouth is because mm -hmm. literally joke <laughs> about eating money um so <laughs> the the idea that like no look if you really believe this you should be prepared to take this bet if you, the fact that you won't take this bet means that you don't really believe it right i think there there are i think it was mentioned in the post as well though that the the sheeps and the apples thing is because lots of times I mean, we live at such a higher level of the world than where physics happens that lots of times it does look like different rules apply to different things. Like birds can fly, squirrels can't. Why exactly is that? I don't know. You know, they, they appear to work with different rules. Like the sun is in the sky and doesn't fall down, unlike every physical thing we've ever seen. Why does that work? I don't know. There's different rules for the sun and the moon and things that are up there. And yeah. 
and I think and he Eliezer pointed out that once once you know why the rules work, you can see that they're the same for sheep and apples. And uh, where was what did he say? Oh yeah, Isaac Newton is justly revered revered not for his outdated theory of gravity, but for discovering that amazingly and surprisingly. The celestial planets in the glorious heavens obeyed just the same rules as falling apples, which is kind of a big deal. Yeah, I liked the well, I, a bit of a digression. I liked the um, you know, the bad answer to why might things be this. You know, if you could be that compartmentalized, it's like all right. So if seven sheep go out and eight go out, fifteen had better come back. Mm -hmm. Why fifteen and not fourteen or three? A bad, you know, if someone doesn't really understand counting, the reason might be because otherwise you don't get dinner tonight mm -hmm. if if the wrong number come back, but. Uh, but if you understand the rules, there's a deeper reason. Right. And then that's more generalizable. Yeah. yeah. So at the very end of this post, he brings it back to... This is entirely a coincidence, by the way. I did not plan for these two things to coincide like this. But he brings it back to, maybe we can beat the proverb, be rational in our personal lives, not just our professional lives. Maybe we can do better. An ambition that lacks the comfortable modesty of being able to confess that outside of your speciality, you're no better than anyone else. And that, yeah, I mean, I guess that helped spark the whole rationalists should do better in the world than people without rationality thing as well, because you should be able to do better, right? If yeah. you're able to really actually understand the rules. Yeah. If you think of winning as making your beliefs pay rent rather than a, you, you, you know, your terminal goal should be to run a successful business or to be the next Elon Musk, then that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. It's just a way of checking yourself. So you wreck yourself less. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I was, I was, when I read that, when I read that, I was very, he, he links the comfortable modesty back to the post um, about that we covered, I think either one or two episodes ago about false modesty. I almost didn't pull this to include it in here because I felt like really scared and challenged by this line. As in, I was like, oh shit, now I have to do better in the real world. I can't just say, look, you know, I'm doing the best I can. I, I'm. I'm just I'm just another guy like everyone else and now I'm like fuck that this this is calling on me to be better and not just hide behind the false modesty of oh what can you do well and that's what the community was asking us too and that's how it ties in really well to the episode right yeah. the community wants to know why aren't we crushing it all the time mm -hmm. and there's people looking at answers for that and how best approaches but the sense that there's this, there's this sense that and I think I agree that we shouldn't be content to not be doing better if, if there's if there's avenues to success we should be damn well able to incorporate them and, and use them right yeah. especially if they're things we actually want yeah and there are things we want we listed a bunch of goals that the community did have um you know uh improving ai Im improving you know epistemic rationality improving uh you know people's cognitive awareness of biases and whatnot uh, effective altruism if these are things that we do all agree that we want, then it, I almost think it's a cop-out to not pursue them. Yeah, and we win by not destroying the world every single day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Baseline winning. That's not losing. All right. I think it also helps us to function better in, in a society that is not optimized for us. Yeah, what do you mean by that? I don't know. I think that society is more optimized for people that... Oh, that just want to, you know, follow baseline reality? Yeah. Have the two kids and the house and like, the certain I've, salary. I've always felt that I don't fit into the world very well, that I'm kind of weird and odd. And this has helped me relate to the world and understand it and how I fit in quite a bit better. And also, like, finding a community of like-minded people has helped quite a bit, too, with that. Yeah, I agree. There was someone in the comments of one of the articles, I forget, it might have been Sailor Vulcans, said that it was a mistake to to make a community out of rationality. And yeah. I kind of chafed at that because I was like, well, first of all, I don't think that it would ever not be a community mm -hmm. if you get enough people who are like-minded. Like they were saying, Les Long should have just been a project group in the moment that we tied all of our relationships and our friendships and everything into it. it that was a bad idea. I think not. I think a lot of people actually have like improved their lives a lot by having groups of people that are like-minded. Yeah. Strong <laughs> I mean, disagree it, as well. Even It, it just gives me uh, more accountability, if nothing else, for like, what, why aren't you achieving your goals? If I'm in a community of people who care about the same things I care about and notice that I'm deluding myself, you know, I can't check myself all the time, but it's useful to have other people around me that can say, hey, you said you were going to do this and didn't. What happened? Yeah. Cultivating a community that holds you that can help you hold yourself to higher standards. And remind me what my values are is pretty important too, because it's easy to fall back into the, you know, societal default mindset. Yeah, if you're just doing what everyone else is doing, then you won't even know if you're making a mistake or not, right? You're just, you're just following the script. Jess, I totally believe you can wait six more days for a new phone. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> it's really inconvenient. It's just a few more days. You can do it. Yeah. 
I, I might have already picked out the phone I want anyway, and I doubt there's going to be a really good Black Friday sale on it, but it's, uh-huh. it's worth waiting just in case. Okay. And that's the shocking way that I realized that today is November 17th and not oh way earlier in the month. So. Yeah. All right. Um, Can someone get working on that time machine, too? Yeah, geez. At the very least, it's a time turner. If I could just have a few more hours each day. I. That's one thing that I just loved about this irrationality was his, like, wanting to have a three-hour wedding with him and Quirrell and the time turner. Because, like, I totally get your <laughs> yeah. love for the time turner. Yeah. I'm as infatuated with it as you are, and I'd be just as ecstatic and protective of it as you are. Yeah. My favorite thing about it was he's like, immediately, oh, I've got the ability to control time. What should I do first? Prank myself. <laughs> <laughs> I only get one chance to fuck with myself this hard. I'm going So delightful. <laughs> All right, uh, next episode, we will talk about the episodes Politics is the Mind Killer, dun dun dun, it shows up, uh, and Just Lose Hope Already. And there will be links to both of those at thebasinconspiracy.com. Yep. Cool. Uh, let's see here. We've got, I think we've been not going for quite a while, right? We have. Oh yeah. my god. We, we should just do an episode on feedback then, because I want to get to this feedback, but... We've been going for more than two hours. And it keeps being more feedback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Next episode, you want to just hit feedbacks? Yeah. Okay. If we, we'll, we'll find some, sometime in the next month to hit a feedback episode. Cool. Because, yeah, I, do, I, do, I really do want to get into these, but uh, not enough time now. I think putting in the less wrong posts is cutting out time for, like, rat chat and feedbacks. So. That's true. Uh, yeah. But yeah. I think it's fun. So. Yeah. I really like doing the less wrong posts. I want to keep that in. Me too. But what we always have time for is to thank a patron every, every episode. Hell yeah. This week, we've got Glenn Willen. Thank you so much for your support. It means the world to us. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. Let's see. If you want to support the show, you can find you can do so at patreon.com slash the, search the Bayesian Conspiracy. Um, if you don't have the time or money and don't want to, that's totally cool. You can give be- us a review on iTunes. You can comment in the subreddit on the website. Be part of the community building stuff that we're talking about. Um, or attend local less wrong meetups or whatever it is you feel like doing. Uh, but- yeah, if there's a local less wrong meetup, that... That, I mean, it'll make your life better to go, probably. Probably. Good, good frame. Okay. Huh? Oh, good, yeah. I went to a couple in Fort Collins before uh, I came out to Denver, mm-hmm. and I didn't have a great time. Oh. Well, I mean, I was new to the thing, and they were, like, kind of, they were standoffishly. Mm. Um, and I, there wasn't, and there was, like, three people there, too. So, but it was fun. They got together every two weeks for coffee or something. I thought that was great. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, then I realized there wasn't one in Denver, so I wanted to make one happen here, and this one is more fun. It's also way, like, there's more people here. And, <laughs> no, theirs was casual. It was at a coffee shop. It was just, uh, you know. Oh, they weren't, like, doing uh, any kinds of exercises or No, no, they just, they just got together. One of them, they were, like, two in their early 20s, and one woman was in her 30s or 40s. But they just got together and chatted like we do. But it was just a, maybe I'm also older and more sociable than I was. That's probably the majority of the factor. <laughs> so scratch the whole thing. I'm going to cut that all out. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can leave it in. You had, you know, a different experience. Yeah. So I guess I'll leave that in for the sense of if you don't have fun at your first one, try again or make your own. Yeah. You can have two competing rival less wrong food can- <laughs> less wrong groups in the We in can the have city. blue and green less wrong groups. That's right. And the first joint races beat each other up. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's all I got for this week. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. All right. And thanks for joining us again, Jess. Oh, yes. no, you're welcome. Thanks. Bye.